welcome uh, you to this 2022 introduction to NeuroPixels course, um, which will which has happened every year, but this year is shorter than usual, and um, it's it's just a series of pointers to um, to longer material that you can find elsewhere. And I think Andy and Serian will explain this better than me. Um, for now, it suffice it to say that if you go into Google and you put these words 2022 UCL NeuroPixels, you will find this web page, um, uh, which we could also put in the, I, I think I've already put it in the chat, uh, where you will find the times of the lectures. Um, hopefully if you click on them, you will get them in your time zone. And there's a YouTube channel from that for now has last year's lectures, which were much longer with much more material. So today I'll just give you a uh, brief introduction to NeuroPixels. And I want to remind you that uh, the way we record from neurons electrophysiologically is by inserting probes in the brain um, and hoping that these neurons are near the recording sites. So there has been, um, you know, a you know, six decade effort or more to try to put more and more of these sites in the brain close to each other. And so the, maybe the first effort that really succeeded was David Hugel's uh, microelector in wire, in, uh, in glass. Um, oh, I should probably get a laser pointer. Here we go. Um, and then a very successful one in 2005 was this polytrode. Um, now you can see that the polytrode suffered from the same problem that our spinal cord suffers from, which is that as you go up, most of the space was taken up by wires, which is true of our spinal cord too, by the way. Um, and, um, and so these wires at the time were about 1.5 uh, micron wide. Um, and that was uh, something that the, uh, for the semiconductor industry, that was an enormous size and something that could be improved on. So um, by the time these uh, electrodes came out, uh, we were up here and the NeuroPixels consortium, thanks to engineers such as Carolina, who will speak uh, after me, um, uh, increased this number dramatically, the number of sites per shank or per electrode that you put in the brain uh, to about a thousand um, by decoupling the number, by using much smaller circuitry, um, which is more similar to what we have in our mobile phones and by decoupling the number of sites from the number of wires. So a NeuroPixels probe has 960 sites over one centimeter, uh, but only 384 channels, which you need to assign to the sites. And what's very cool about it also is that all the amplification and digitization happens on board. So with these kind of probes, um, the community has been doing some pretty experiments that were unbelievable. Uh, when I was a PhD student, I think my entire PhD thesis was about 200 neurons. Um, and this was half an hour of recording by Nick in which he recorded from about 750 neurons by putting two probes at the same time. Um, and he extended this um, kind of work by in, in, implanting multiple probes, usually two at a time, multiple mice, and recording from about 30,000 neurons in 42 brain regions while mice were doing a specific behavioral task. I won't tell you anything about the findings, but this kind of set a new standard for how we do electrophysiolog electrophysiology during behavior to try to understand the brain as a whole. One of the beautiful features of a neuropixels probe is that it's one centimeter long and the mouse brain or the rat brain, they're not that big. So even if you don't want to, you end up recording from a lot of regions that you didn't think you were interested in, but actually then you discovered that they were you're likely to discover that they were quite interesting, maybe as interesting as the ones that you were aiming for. Um, a few years later, we published another paper in which we um, went from NeuroPixels 1.0 to 2.0. Uh, the biggest change is that there are now four shanks uh, and that the number of sites has gone to 5,000, but you still need to choose 384 of them, at least as things stand. But with this configuration, you can choose the, for example, say you're interested in the striatum of the mouse, you will insert a probe this way and you'll say, I'm interested in the sites that are here. And you will have an, a, a vast number of re recorded sites from the striatum, for example. Uh, something that also is optimized, as you can see, is the size of the probe. The, this, this is all much smaller and lighter, which is ideally suited to chronic recordings. Uh, the recordings I showed you before were acute, meaning 
one inserts them and takes them out um, in the same day. Uh, whereas these are chronic recordings, um, and you can see that over a number of days, the number of recording new recorded neurons decreases, but not dramatically so. Uh, and uh, oh, apologies, there's a little rectangle here that shouldn't be there. Um, and another thing that changed is the uh, arrangement of the sites on the shank, uh, which is now linear. And this might seem like a small difference, but uh, besides the fact that the spacing is a little tighter, but this allows us to undo the movement of the brain much better, thanks also to software that has improved. And to demonstrate this, uh, here is an example where we first have the um, natural movement of the brain relative to the probe. But here, the, from this moment on, um, uh, the probe is being advanced and uh, pushed in and out of the brain on purpose, okay, rhythmically. And as you can see, this, this is a representation of the data that hopefully you will hear about later on today, where dark means bigger spike and light means smaller spike. And because of this geometry and of the software, uh, we're now able to undo this motion, both the motion of the brain relative to the probe that the brain has, the motion that the brain has normally because of the animal is moving or breathing or the heartbeat and motion that we impose. So something else that we can do is follow the exact same neurons for days and days and days. And this is something that Anna Lebedeva showed um, in which she recorded from neurons in the primary visual cortex where we have a trick to find out whether we're recording from always the same neuron or different neurons, um, which is that different neurons respond to different combination of images. For example, neuron nine responds to these two images, image 34 and image 19, more than image 69. Neuron 19 only responds to image 69 and so on. So you can create a picture of every neuron uh, which images it likes, and then see if that picture changes day after day. And what we found is that we could go, you know, 30, 50 days um, and find the same neurons. Of course, the number would decrease, but not dramatically so. And so I think that this opens uh, the possibility of uh, new kinds of recordings in which you follow the same neurons and you ask, which, which by the way, is totally doable already with two photon imaging, but now you can do it deep in the brain. Um, and and ask what is changing about those neurons. The IMEC is a nonprofit institution. So these, um, uh, there's a contract between IMEC and the funders of the NeuroPixels project, such that IMEC sells them a cost price. And the cost price has been about 1,200 euros for the 1.0. And about 10,000 of them have been delivered up to now, which has been a very explosive growth. And they are used in about 700 laboratories. The 2.0 probes are still in beta. They're not released yet. Um, Another indication of uh, uptake is the number of citations to these papers. Um, and just in case you want to know what the timeline for these things is, uh, here's a timeline for the 1.0. We piloted them in 2014, but you didn't get to see, see anything about that. We published them in 2017, and we released them to the public in 2019. And the idea with the 2.0s is pretty much the same. Okay, so hopefully we were supposed to release them in late 2022. Uh, that did not happen because the semiconductor industry is in, is in big upheaval. We're hoping for early 2022. Um, I will now say that the challenges of, are, of course, uh, that you get a lot of data, you need to process it, you need to spike sort it, you need to align it to histology, and this course will tell you all about it, or at least give you some useful pointers. And um, these are the people who you will hear about from, I mean, uh, Celia and Andy are the organizers of the course. All of these lecturers who I hope I've correctly put in uh, uh, alphabetic order will, will talk to you. Uh, and Nick and I are just the advisory board, meaning we've done essentially nothing, if you allow me to say this, Nick. Um, and I will stop here and I believe um, uh, you, Silian and Andy, should be able to share their screen.